Welcome to the Shit Shower and Self Care podcast, a place for men to talk about the stuff that matters. For now, grab yourself a drink and let's crack on. Hi, thanks for thanks for joining. So, as we mentioned, my name's Steve Jones, and this is the first episode of the Shit Shower and Self Care podcast. So, for the first the first episode, I'm delighted to be joined by uh, Dr. Ian Gill, who's a clinical psychologist and clinical lead of an eating disorders service in Manchester. Now, we're going to talk about quite a few things today quite a lot around eating behaviours, eating disorders, that type of thing. So that comes obviously with a, a little bit of a, an asterisk to look after yourself, sort of know what works for you. If anything we talk about is a little bit sensitive. However, what we are going to try to do is keep this as, as easy as we can do. However, Ian knows himself far better than I ever could do. So I'm going to ask, Ian, can I ask you to introduce yourself a little bit, please? Yeah, hello, and what a welcome! I'm delighted uh, to be here. Thank you for thank you for asking me to come along. Um, so yeah, like as you said, like I'm a I'm a clinical psychologist, and I I work in eating disorders. Uh, worked in eating disorders for about ten years, uh-huh. I think it is now. Which which it doesn't feel like ten years. It feels like I qualified yesterday in some ways. <laughs> I can I can definitely relate to that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so and I, I work in the NHS, um, and that yeah, eating disorders is my passion. So um, yeah, yeah. Well, like I say, thank you for thank you for coming on. One of the one of the things we mentioned, we want this to be as easy a conversation as we can. So before we started recording, I just mentioned to Ian, obviously, what we want to imagine. I want you to imagine as listeners, as if we're sat on two bar stools in a pub, a bar, a place of your choice or your imagination. Now, if I were to ask you, Ian, what would be in your glass? What would be in my glass? Um, It might be quite an empty glass, honestly, if I'm in the pub. But what would be like... (laughs) Um, Okay, so I'm partial to two two drinks in particular. Like, I'm I'm not too fussy when it comes to drinks, but um, I like a gin. Uh, Hendrix in particular, I like, as long as it's made right, as long as it's made right. And um, if not a gin, if I'm not in a kind of gin mood, probably a red wine, maybe. Okay. Um, Shiraz in particular is like one of my go-tos. So usually you'd find me with one of those uh, in the pub. I definitely have to swing towards the red wine. I cannot deal with gin. I you really can't. can't. I want to, be- I want to sort of get on board the trend, but I just can't do it. I've tried. There was a there was a big trend of it a few years. That's when I got on board with the gin about six years ago. So, <laughs> yeah, my 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 wife drinks it. It smells like pop puree to me. So or pop puree, as my mum calls it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Hopefully, that paints a little bit of a picture to the audience. So you're sat there with your glass of red wine. I'm sat there with a pint of, well, let's. I am fully on brand at the minute, so I'm all on IPAs at the minute. Can I ask what? I, I reached out to you on Twitter and I yes. asked about sort of coming on this podcast to talk about male mental health, well-being. Yeah. And I asked why you said yes. Well, when I when I saw you were doing it, like it just really jumped out at me as a thing that just felt so important. Je- generally speaking, in terms of you know men's mental health and and just being able to speak about that more openly, but particularly in eating disorders it goes a bit unspoken really in eating disorders like we have increasing kind of awareness of it but it's still it's still a bit of a kind of taboo not a taboo subject that that's the wrong word for it but we we don't see as many men in eating disorder services as perhaps we should do um so there's still big barriers and to be able to kind of come on at something like this and just talk about it and just think about it with you like absolutely uh it just seemed like a a golden opportunity and to be able to just think about raising awareness of eating disorders uh yeah well thank thank you for taking a chance on it um we'll 
we'll get to a lot of the things that you've mentioned. There's quite a few themes that you've already touched on there that I really want to circle back to. Um, but first off, just to give a bit of a bit of landscape, yeah. what's can you tell me a bit about your work? What what sort of things do you encounter? So, um, do you know, like you'd, you'd meet many psychologists that work in eating disorder services that, that have slightly different roles. I guess my role is going to be quite different to other psychologists you might talk to. Um, but, but essentially, so we, we, well, I work in a community eating disorder service in the NHS. And we see people with the kind of well, all sorts of kind of different relationships with foods that have become problematic in, in one way or another. Um, so, for example, we, you know, I, I guess I guess the kind of the, the, the ones people know about mainly are kind of anorexia, anorexia nervosa. Um, so we see people who have a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa. And that's when um, people would limit their food intake purposefully uh, or kind of over-exercise, say, to try and influence the shape of their body or their weight. And they, they, that will be combined with kind of a fear, like quite an intense fear of uh, gaining that weight back. Um, so we... You know, so that that's one of the big ones people know about. But we also see people with bulimia nervosa. So that's when um, people's relationship with food would include what we call binge eating, where you eat a lot more food uh, in a short period of time um, and feel quite upset or distressed about it. And then there's kind of compensatory measures as well. So. The compensatory measures can be can be all sorts of things. So that can be exercise as well. That can be um, being sick after eating, taking laxatives, um, missing meals again because we feel like we've eaten too much. So therefore, we kind of almost want to make up for it in some way. And then um, we also would see people with what we call binge eating disorder. So that's where there's uh, the there's binging on food present, um, but th there's not necessarily the compensatory behaviours. Um, so it's in the absence of those compensatory behaviours. So that that they're the three main kind of eating disorders that we see, and you know they look different for everyone that experiences them. So although you know it's a limited number of kind of diagnoses people's stories around them and, and how people kind of present with them is so different. Um, so that is our kind of, um, yeah, that, that's, our, that's what we do, right? We help people to understand their relationship with food and, and hopefully recover from it. But it's interesting to hear you say a couple of times the things around exercise or the use of other means or things like laxatives to try and control how that works for them. And I'm just wondering what, do you think that's just as important as focusing on the eating or is it a bit of both? Um, so how I kind of look, look at uh, trying to help people and trying to help people understand what's going on for them. Um, it is, you know, when we, when we work with people with eating disorders, you know, food is absolutely a part of it as, as are the kind of behaviors around it but it, it's it's as well about kind of what's underneath that and what's what's fueling that for people you know why have people developed these kind of really difficult relationships and destructive relationships with food or exercise or kind of other behaviors so it's it's a bit of both so it's about it is about the food and we want to think about the food but we want to think about kind of you know the broader context, the landscape in which kind of people have developed these difficulties, um, and that again, it's it's di it's so different. Like everyone's story is so individual when it comes to their relationship with food. Thanks for saying. It's interesting again just to hear that. The because when when 
you hear that in sort of, let's say you pick up a newspaper or you pick up a, you see an online article now to read to newspapers, but you see that <laughs> and it says something like anorexia, it says something like bulimia and it is, you just see this umbrella, it's like, right, so everyone's under that cat, everyone is there and that's that little box and it, it I've heard you say a few times, you know, that actually everyone's story is different everyone's relationship with food what that means to them is different how do you how do you hit that balance between this is a an umbrella term but yet everyone we work with is an, an individual <clears throat> oh this the, the, it, we could have a whole kind of service <laughs> of a podcast on this i think like it's one of it's one of the things we really really struggle with in eating disorders and as a society about how we look at those terms you know if you if you picked up a, a paper or, or looked online that there's certain images that and stories and narratives that go around the terms anorexia and bulimia um, and interestingly binge eating binge eating doesn't get a look in in the same way the other two do it, it is a newer kind of, it is a new kind of category for diagnoses, I guess. But um, there's such stereotypes that just consume those diagnoses. Um, and, and we have to work with, um, you know, even other health professionals to help them get past the stereotypes, the images, the narratives that go along with those labels, right? So the the you know the, the words bulimia and anorexia, you say that to people, and certain images will probably come up in their mind about who experiences them, what they're about, you know, why people do them, and you know, even the people we work with, we have to kind of sometimes work with them in understanding it in a different kind of way as well. Yeah, I'm just I. The reason I ask is just hearing all the, the the stereotypes, the stuff that I've heard people say. You know those thro- sort of throwaway comments that people give. Oh, I don't understand how you could do that. I don't. Know. But it's this thing of it's really hard to put into words. It's everyone that they're talking about a group. So how can you do this? But it's not personalized. It's not really about a person. They just see this sort of sort of neon sign above their head almost. Oh yeah, ab- absolutely, absolutely, and it's. It's like, um, you know, if we, if you, if you talk to males how, who have eating disorders, <clears throat> quite often what you can hear is um, how those stereotypes and those kind of uh, the biases that, that we all have at times around eating disorders, like men struggle to get the help they need you know you can it, it happens to women as well absolutely and and other genders but men um you know some of the some of the men i've worked with often have to fight to get into the service often have to to kind of really work quite hard to get to get past the starting line when people do get past the starting line does that mean they present slightly differently on average obviously it is individuals but do they end up being more extreme by the time you know in terms of presentation to get past the starting line um oh that's a yeah that's a big question i think um i think people can you know the longer people live with an eating disorder the more entrenched it can become and the more severe it can become and the more that you know it, it becomes um part of their lives in a way that it wasn't when it first started so like we you know we shouldn't be putting up barriers to get care and we know as well we know that people take quite a long time to go to their gps to seek help for an eating disorder to begin with so then if they're going to their gp and then they're kind of turned away because the GP isn't recognising what's going on, or the GP perhaps holds certain views 
that you know that type of person doesn't have an eating disorder they that that isn't the type of person that would suffer with eating difficulties it just it just creates such problems you know if you if you go to your gp for help and you're told you don't have a problem when you do um you know the eating disorder is absolutely going to take hold of that um you know you're not sick enough you're not unwell enough this isn't this isn't an issue just keep doing what you're doing yeah that's exactly what i heard in my head then it's like well it's fine then it's this is, fine this is this is okay this is manageable this will just crack on doing what i'm doing and i'll be fine absolutely so the eating disorder will take hold of that and run with it um and that's just not what it's not it's not what we want at all um so it can those messages from kind of those stereotypes um just create so many barriers for people yeah it's interesting hearing that you could we could be talking about eating disorders could be talking about a lot of things couldn't we that thing of i'm asking for help and you sort of not quite understood not quite recognized oh i'll be all right then absolutely and as well we know as well if people if men if men go to seek help for their problems with food they are more likely than females to kind of uh be sent to another kind of mental health service um or be diagnosed with something else um this isn't this isn't specific to males and i i, I wouldn't want to yeah. try it like it females do uh people from ethnic minorities also really struggle to kind of get past the gp at times um but it yeah men can and i should say <laughs> I feel like I'm, I'm sat here kind of just discrediting GPs. I'm not. No, there are many yeah. good GPs out there. <laughs> yeah, and that is the last thing we want to do because that is not the case. I totally get that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but we've we've sort of gone gone around it a little bit. Can I ask a little bit about your experience? How do men tend to communicate or use food to communicate their needs? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so again, like I guess, um, again, you'll you'll get you'll get bored of me saying this, but everyone is very different in what they're communicating with their relationship with food. But I think it's a really nice way to think about it. The idea that it, the eating disorder, functions in some way to communicate something going on for that person and then their individual needs, and they can be they can be you know, um, social needs, relationship needs, emotional needs, um, needing to be seen in a certain way, needing to feel a certain way. Um, and that, that there can be there can be similarities and overlaps between across genders in that sense. Um, but I guess it, I guess for males, again, I should say, like the, the research on males and eating disorders is really limited. I, th I think it's about I think I think it's about one percent of the eating disorder research is based on males, which within itself. Yeah, it's like it's just so every all the way we even think about eating disorders comes from this kind of like quite female dominated paradigm so it's really hard to understand male eating disorders we just have no we're not anywhere near where we should be in understanding it so this is a really hard question but there are you know there are some there are some differences that we do know about so for example one of the key differences that we know between males and females in eating disorders is that the female onset like pe females tend to um, develop their eating disorders in adolescence and kind of that around that age, um, males tend to, not always, but tend to kind of develop it or can develop it later on in life. Okay. So that is a, that's a key difference. Now, why why that's a difference, I don't think we're quite sure, but some relate it to kind of men wanting to lose weight earlier on uh later on in life but you could start to think about it um in terms of men's view of their life 
at a certain age and how that how that might be different for males than females but we just the truth is we just don't we just don't we just don't know um there is another there is another kind of kind of more there's another kind of theory on kind of the difference between males and females i guess and and the, the kind of increasing prevalence of male eating disorders so um there are more males with eating disorders than we originally thought we used to think it was something like one in ten now we think it's about one in four people with eating disorders are male and again right but we also think kind of the you know there's more males there's increasing number of males with eating disorders you know um one there's there's a theory around kind of uh i guess the sociological and gender kind of aspects of that um so as there's been i'd like to hear your thoughts on this actually as there's been increased in equality over the you know the last few decades which that absolutely of course should be yeah. some some have argued that that is kind of um threatened the male kind of masculinity um across across the genders so then they males then kind of start to kind of put that masculinity into their body being bigger for example kind of having more muscles right. yeah. and being a kind of visual masculine figure now i'm not i i don't know if that's true or not who knows it's an interesting theory um but again just again just a difference with males perhaps on why what it means to them to have an eating disorder yeah it's that that is interesting and i do i i'm trying to think what do i think of that so when i'm i'm thinking of my own sort of uh my own sort of relationship with food and i can remember um how that's how that has changed quite a lot um over the years and how um when it, so when I was younger, when I used to play football a lot, I used to go through periods where I really intensely controlled what I was eating when I was it, so I could make sure that I was fit and I could run around for ninety minutes and I were all right. And then as I've stopped doing that, oh crap, I can't eat anymore because I'm not burning through all of that at the weekend. Oh, uh, and almost that had almost a bit of a an elastic effect, almost shot back a bit too far. Whereas I've now got to a point where uh, uh, I'll have a bit of cake, it's fine, who cares? And it's it's softened off a little bit because I think I've got to a point of acceptance that I'm not fit, as in I'm not as fit as I was. My That was a big part of my identity. Whereas it can't be anymore because I'm getting a bit older and a bit slower and a bit more injured, blah, 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 and a bit greyer, all those type of things. <laughs> I don't... I don't Everything. see any grey hairs here. I don't see... Oh, it's good. Like it's good lighting. <laughs> um, but and you just sort of go, oh, I can see how easy that can that can flip and that can turn. Uh, uh, absolutely, and like just you know, I, 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 you know, I think it's important to acknowledge, like, kind of what I hear when you say that, like, we all have a relationship with food, right? Yeah. We all have our, our relationship with food is not neutral, and. From a very young age, we start, well, from, you know, day dot, we start to develop this relationship with food and emotions. And then it just get you know, it gets complex as we get older. Yeah. We have so many messages from society, media, about genders, like all sorts of things that kind of... The, I'm like, just thinking, how many times do I say to my toddler, you'll be big, you know, eat that and you'll be big and strong eat your veg and get into mime sort of putting his muscles up and he loves it. I think, oh, hold on. <laughs> what am I, what am I telling him? Big and strong. Big and, yeah, exactly. Big and strong. Right. Uh, I got, I got told as a kid, this isn't about weight, but I got told as a kid about, uh, eat my crusts and I'll get curly hair. And as you can see, I've got yep. extremely curly hair. <laughs> yeah. And I, I have to stop myself every so often and say, if you, you know, if you eat that, you can have this. You get the nice thing if you eat, because what am I saying? Eating's not actually that nice. Eat your veg, eat your eat your veg and your 
your bit of chicken because we know that's crap, but you want your chocolate, so eat this first. Essentially, what- I think it's such it's such a natural thing to do, isn't it? Like such a it natural is. thing to time. talk about food in this kind of like it has some kind of moral value for us. Like it's good or bad. Ed- like education settings absolutely reinforce that. I think particularly these days, messages from messages from the NHS and the government absolutely reinforce all of that about what is healthy what is not healthy and actually you know you just start to question what is health and what is kind of uh um, inverted commas healthy relationship with food um and we are so we're so we're so saturated in messages around that like they're just all around us when you start to look the the thing that i asked at the beginning the you know, you'd be sat there with your glass of red wine with <laughs> how many calories? I'm sat there with a pie. Like, me, neither of those are going to, you know, you're not going to... We talk about relationship with food, but actually it's with drink as well, isn't it? When we're talking about eating behaviour, we sometimes forget about drink as well. And if I go out with my mates and have six, seven pints, that's a significant amount, not just alcohol. Yeah, yeah. And we, again, just how we... How we normalize that or how we talk about that between our friendship groups or or to ourselves like um and di- you know you go into different cultures they have a very different view of uh their relationship with food and their relationship with alcohol and um again just societies build these messages for us and then that's what we think is the norm right so i was gonna one of the things i wanted to ask was around sort of this idea of using food to communicate with others so of the the interpersonal relationships we'd call it um if we're going to get our little psychology hats on yeah. or being around other people if we don't have that on but how do we think or how do you think sort of men might use food to communicate with others and those relationships how people use food to communicate with others mm. uh that's a really interesting question i don't goodness i've always thought about it the other way around like what are are how and this is this is the eating disorder psychologist in me what um how do males communicate or how do we communicate with each other that then leads to difficulties with food but we i guess we're you know we use food in our culture to communicate all the time right like um it's hard it's hard to think about something you do socially without eating in some way yeah um for all sorts of kind of you know celebrations commiserations birthdays christmas easter uh catch up with friends like they all center usually around eating something right so i i go on Oh, go on. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say it's just a it's a way for us to kind of be with people in a way. Like it's a way for us to kind of um, be in each other's company. I think. I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? I I think <laughs> there's yeah. I think there is something about that because I'm thinking of you mentioning sort of festivals, you know, Christmas, and sort of how because I I love cooking, and I love cooking Christmas dinner and things like that, and that pokey little kitchen that's downstairs and there's just absolute chaos for what is essentially you sat down for less than an hour to eat it but it brings everyone together for the absolute volcano that's erupted all over my worktops (laughs) and i'm cleaning up for about three days afterwards um but it also got me thinking that uh sort of food everything we do is around food and how we use that to communicate so one of my mates and he'll know who he is if he ever listens to this um remember going out and we were just together just having a few beers for chat and he decided to get these they were like pork scratchings but they were nuclear chili hot like (laughs) stupid okay and you eat it i'll not say what we both said afterwards but my (laughs) god that were unpleasant neither of us stopped eating them purely 
almost sort of locking eyes with each other, sweat pouring down your face, going, I'm not going to give up on this. And it was purely on, it was food that was, we were, it was almost a test. Now, I know that's a really silly example, but what we eat, how we eat it, where we eat it, is it's communicating something, isn't it? It's it's a, it's a good example. Like I don't I don't know what you I'll not say what I was communicating at that point, but we'll yeah. yeah. I am that, talking to a psychologist when I say that. That kind of that kind of one up friendship, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, like it it's bringing back memories of kind of uh, times I've been with friends and kind of. Um, a very similar story actually but mine wasn't over port scratchings mine was over Vindaloo back at university yep. <laughs> and you you just you know you, you're with your friends and you it, it, again you just wouldn't you, you just didn't back down at all um, yeah no one's ordering a pasanda at that table are they? no, <laughs> no. Um, and actually, actually a really unpleasant experience <laughs> overall <laughs> food for all of us it's a kind of really personal mm-hmm. I dare I say intimate experience right so if I'm eating with people and they will comment on my food and what I'm eating in some way it, it feel always feels a little bit jarring do you know what I mean in the wrong context like it just there's something quite personal about what we do with food i think um and i think that i think that goes again being a psychologist of course i'm going to relate it back to childhood and yeah our relationship and things like that but um i think we all have ways of being with food and we all have thoughts about food that are kind of influenced by people we're with our context kind of media and all of that kind of thing um and and i don't i don't think i don't think people are immune to that right now we're talking about how we communicate with others is there anything that you've noticed in sort of you mentioned society earlier and sort of media have you noticed anything in particular about society or sort of how this is portrayed in the media recently that makes any of this better worse or i think the um well you know like we live in a we live in a culture now that is dominated by social media images instagram likes followers retweets all of that kind of stuff and i think um again that get that that kind of gets under our skin that gets into our head a little bit um and i think kind of people um well we know that so if if men if men are exposed to certain types of social media pictures let's say we know that even just a brief exposure to that can have a a really negative impact on how they view their own body their own aesthetic Uh, so if we are constantly in a society that you know how, how often do you find yourself scrolling on instagram or twitter and you see certain things and 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 that that is not neutral that will have an effect on us right um and it's but it's not it's not just social media so um the wow goodness what year was it it wasn't too long ago no oh, actually we're in, we're in 2022 aren't we yeah, so, quite, 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 I, I still i still think we're in 2020 um so i think it was late 2000s um men's mental health uh men's mental health men's health magazine yep became the most published um the most broad kind of publication over and above um soft porn publications for the first time ever so before that the <laughs> what men were buying was very different but yep. around late 2000s men's health took over so it just again I think it just shows like um i'm not sure what i'm not sure if that's still the case or not but i think it just shows kind of how the media what we buy Mm. 
and changing kind of interests in our aesthetic and our and our fitness or this kind of uh, athleticism um it there's in, there's a growing kind of nature for men mm. in it uh, and it's it's big books right it's big money like if you can you know is a business if you can if you can make people feel insecure and people are going to spend money because of that insecurity, yep. you are you are kind of looking at a good business you're fueling model. if you've got the you provide the fuel and you provide the the cure in that sense Absolutely. yeah well, you, yeah as you were talking then you were making me so around that time as well you've got the the explosion in comic book movies that shifted so i i now every time so I, i'm a massive sort of comic book nerd unapologetically so but you look at that and you've got people like hugh jackman chris Hemsworth, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. who are absolutely stacked they are huge huge men what they don't tell you is a how much training they have to do but b how before so i know uh so henry cavill who plays uh, Superman, who is just, uh, yeah, he's an absurdly looking man, which is just not fair for the rest of us because he is that huge. Also know that he does massive amounts of reps just before the camera starts rolling, so he's absolutely as much as he can be. But he has to suffer so much for that by eating chicken and broccoli for about six months. And just doing horrendous regimes that you see that and go, that's what I want to be. That's what I should be. Isn't you've just got you're setting yourself up to it's an impossible hill to climb, isn't it? It absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And it's interesting, like the the, the kind of you know the, the, the Marvel films and other kind of superhero films, like they they portray these kind of images, don't they? And the, what kids or or adults see as well as these kind of uh i don't even want to say body ideals because it just creates something that again to aspire to but these kind of images for men um that it's just so i I don't want to say out of touch of reality but that's kind of what it it sort of is isn't it like the the one that i'll always that i always go to is that wolverine so hugh jackman who plays wolverine who is you know, in terms of muscle bound, he's off on a different scale, isn't it? The actual character's only about five foot six. In all print media, he's quite yeah. tiny. But yet, mm-hmm. they chose Hugh Jackman, who's about six foot three. <laughs> because oh, you couldn't you couldn't have someone small lose that. You, it just wouldn't work. You need this god tier level person to play this. And it, it just warps then this ideal that everyone's about six foot three, six foot four, but absolutely ripped. And how people then try to eat and control their diet and exercise and all the things that you mentioned to try and meet that. Yeah. If that's starting when you're 13, 14, instead of like I'm seeing it as a 20 plus year old, yeah, wherever I am now, it's, yeah, I wouldn't want to think what. I'd have thought if that had been happening during my teens. Absolutely. And I, I think it's, you know, you look at stuff like that and you look at kind of how we look at stuff like that. So, for example, being muscly, being in the gym, being athletic, these are all things that we admire almost in mm-hmm. society. Where actually... Um, these things can be really problematic you know if you if you become consumed by the idea of getting bigger being ripped having a sex pack all of that kind of stuff that can start to take over your life in the same way that the eating disorders i mentioned before did and what's really what's really dangerous about that and what's really dangerous about how we view eating disorders is that there's no um eating disordered kind of diagnosis which captures that so it's been kind of it's been kind of termed uh so some people call it reverse anorexia some people call it bigorexia it's not an official diagnosis in any way 
But it's that idea that people become fixated on bigger and bigger muscles, essentially, mm. and, um, and place a lot of their self-worth in achieving that. And we're, you know, we're all sat here applauding it because we don't see it as disordered when actually for some people, for some people, it very much will be. Yeah, and it's, it's a huge, huge commitment, isn't it? It's not, a, it's not a you do that accidentally for a week and suddenly it appears. It's something that takes a long, long time to get to. Think of, you know, my own experiences in the gym, it takes a huge amount of time to actually see, to notice the difference. And the lens people might go to for that. So, you know, yeah. starting to kind of miss social stuff to go to the gym. You know, some people kind of, their diet is just consumed by things to get bigger, steroids, you know, all the behaviours that go around kind of bulking, I guess, um, are really problematic. And it, and I, I just I just, I think it's, uh just so interesting is the wrong word but it's so interesting that we don't recognize that and i think that comes down to genders again a little bit but it doesn't help the men or the women that are suffering with with that difficulty about kind of being consumed by getting bigger or or ripped, ripped or whatever it is why do you think people don't mention this why is this to do? What like why don't we talk about males with Yeah, or eating? just you know, men or we don't talk about food other than Oh, that looks nice. It's never about anything deeper than that. I think um oh god, like there's so this there's, there's so much in that, isn't there? There's so much in what you just asked. And I yeah. think um again I think <laughs> God, for me, broadly speaking, it comes down to kind of genders, stereotypes, how we'll be viewed, how we won't be viewed, the, the change in the status quo in relationships. So, for example, in eating disorders, um, that, you know, they're largely seen as female disorders, right? They're female mental health difficulties. And we know that can be a barrier for you know, health health professionals picking up on them, but also people seeking help with them. Um, so the idea of kind of having a, you know, quote unquote, female difficulty, again, challenges something for us as men. Yeah. And then we go into kind of um, stereotypes about males and what's kind of perhaps society says we should be as men like i think i i'm hoping this is changing i think it is slowly but that idea of kind of you know not showing emotions stiff upper lips like kind of nothing phases them we don't talk about deep stuff we just kind of have a laugh we, we that's what we do right so to kind of again challenge that stereotype you've got two really powerful stereotypes there going against opening up um so it I think it becomes really hard for men to talk about this stuff. Um, the other, the other, the other thing that we do know as well that can be a barrier men seeking help for this is that um, for heterosexual men, they can see having an eating disorder as. Um, a non-heterosexual thing, so that they're worried about being viewed as non-heterosexual if they seek help for it. So again, we come down to stereotypes and kind of how how we're seen in society. Like it, it raises really big questions, doesn't it? Like, so let's say, for argument's sake, um, eating disorders are more associated with females and more associated with non-heterosexual males right why is that a problem <laughs> why is that a problem for us as males that 
you know, what what is the difficulty there? But that is a huge, huge question and a huge barrier for us, I think. Yeah, it sounds, it, and it is a big question. It's almost like there's little boxes that, like, you know, when I mentioned right, I think right at the beginning about um, the idea that things are viewed in their umbrella term. So the anorexia box, the bulimia box, but whereas we're talking about this is the heterosexual box, this is the male box. Mailbox, that sounds wrong. Um, <laughs> I know what I meant. Um, That's a kind of podcast. <laughs> oh, God, I'm not, no, no. That would not be a good Google search. Um, so it's sort of trying to break through those different barriers, trying to get through that a little bit. Is actually, yeah, we're talking about something bigger than just being able, just in inverted commas, being able to go and ask for help or to even question, I suppose, because you, you're almost shutting yourself down at that point, aren't you? So, nope, there can't be a question here. Because that will... that. Um... I think it goes even further back than that. Like, if we are so saturated by these stereotypes and gender things and all of that, I, I, would, I would say, and again remembering we don't have much research on males and eating disorders, but I would say men struggle to recognize the difficulties in themselves first because they're so consumed by the idea of, well, eating disorders are female difficulties that they're not even, it's not even crossing on some people's radar that they might be struggling yeah. with their food in some way. Some men, that's not for all men, obviously, some men very much aware that they're struggling but I would say a fair proportion probably don't even recognise it in themselves. I'm also thinking of the when the media portrayals of what eating disorders look like, a man would, looking in the mirror wouldn't probably recognise, in some cases, not in all, some really clear on that, but in a lot of cases, men might look in the mirror and not recognise any of those stereotypes that are portrayed in the media in their own reflection. Yeah, I you know, and the, the, the eating disorder will use that and justify it in some way. Well, it's, it's, I don't have a problem. It's me just trying to do, you know, get ready for a race or get ready for X or trying to be just athletic. It will frame it in a way that's more socially acceptable for that person. And then that becomes an issue, right? And that isn't that individual's fault in any way. That's, that's how we frame it as a society. And then that becomes a huge barrier for us. So I think I'm going to, I'm going to ask you a really nice, easy question now. Mentioning four in 10. Yeah. Um, people who have an eating disorder are male. How can we support that four in 10 better? How can we enable greater access or just a greater conversation around this? Um, so I'm not sure if you'll remember this. Um, did you watch the Freddie Flintoff documentary? I've never seen it, no. Oh, right, okay. It's definitely worth a watch. It's definitely worth a watch. Really, really powerful documentary. And amazing what he did. Like, I thought what he did was so brave. So um, he, he, he did this documentary about his struggles with bulimia. Uh, I think it was bulimia. And his journey with it and he you know he went to visit different eating disorder services and he talked about times when it's been really bad for him and i following that i don't i don't know the official stats or anything like that but following that i you know in, in our service we definitely had males come in and say the only reason the only reason i am here is because of that documentary right wow so like it just that within itself changed like gave those people enough kind of whatever it was whether it kind of helped them become more aware or whether it kind of gave them the courage to go speak to the gp or whoever it is that they need to speak to to get help like things like that where you've got someone really well known someone really liked talking about their difficulties with food with such a with such I want well, yeah, a bit of a game changer, really, for mm. me. I think if you had more things like that, um, it would help change 
the narrative. But really what it comes down to, and this is not easy at all, we have to change the way we collectively think about eating disorders and gender and stereotypes around both of those things, n- neither of which are going to happen overnight. But there's, there's definite things in terms of even within the eating disorder field, you know, just just doing more research on men with eating disorders, making sure services are set up to be helpful for males and kind of doing proactive work. So the service I work in, we, we are actively trying to uh, get more males into the service, you know, and get help males access the service. So, it, but it's, it's really hard. It is really difficult. We, we come up against so many barriers with it. Um, but I guess as well, like in terms of kind of what we can do on a personal level, um, I guess just being mindful. First step is just being mindful of our own relationship with food, how we talk about food, how we talk about gender, and just what our kind of expectations of ourselves are in terms mm-hmm. of our gender as well i think yeah just just to end on a nice easy that was huge easy, easy question <laughs> yeah um but as a as a final thing is there any is there anything that you want to throw in anything at all that you want to uh, make sure we talk about today um just the final thing i'd say on uh because uh, it's you know we talked about some some really interesting and, and big questions, but I guess what it comes down to, you know, those those for people perhaps listening to this that might have raised something for them or got them thinking about their own difficulties, like um, you know, if you've got if you've heard something today that uh, makes you question your relationship with food, you know, go to your GP. There there are services there that want to help you and um if you struggle with your gp which we know people do um that there's online support like beat the charity do some great support online uh for people with eating disorders um there's no criteria for those services there's nothing like that um but also just you know if you you know, eating disorder services across the country are there to help you. So if you're struggling with getting into them, contact your local service and have a word with them. Um, so just, I guess, just saying that kind of the help, the help is there. Brilliant. Thank you. And what I'll, what we'll do is I'm going to ask you to send, uh, we'll, we'll put some links in the show notes um, to this, to this episode. Uh, of different different organisations that you might be able to contact, so be one of them, just in case anything's come up. But just and as well, just for just for your information, because it might might not help you, it might help someone else that you know. So um, that will be there to to find as well. And what we're going to do now is we're going to transition into something slightly different. So hopefully. If I can edit this properly, a little musical interlude will just stop (laughs) playing right now. And we'll speak to you in a minute. So, welcome back. I hope that that bit of music's finished playing now and you can hear us both clearly. So, what we're going to do now is part of a regular feature because, yes, we talked about clinical work we talked about a specific aspect of what it is to be a man and sort of the relationship with food and um, eating disorders but I also know that there's something that we all carry with us you know what does it mean to be a man what does it mean to be man and instead of being really dry and asking that I'm going to ask guests each time they come on to tell me about a character whether that's from fiction, gaming, whether it's books, films, whatever that is. A character that inspired them or resonated with them when they were younger. 
I'm not going to put a limit on what younger is. So that could be anything. <laughs> so, no, no pressure there, Ian, but no, you know. I'm going to ask Ian, if you'd be kind enough to give us a character, the character who inspired your ideas, what it means of manliness or male or masculinity or whatever word we're going to use today. Okay, so this is a really tough question. I've uh, I've had to do a little bit of thinking about this, I have to say, but I I kind of, yeah. So I, I had a few different kind of characters go through my mind about, and, and, and certainly made me question about, you know, what what are my values as a male, right? Uh, and who I settled on <laughs> after going back and forth a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if you remember him. So in school, uh, read this book for English literature, I think it was, and um, To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, yep. seen the film. And there's a character in that called Atticus Finch. Uh, and he, I think is someone that I think just represents a lot of values in terms of, I think, what I aspire to in being who I am, no matter what my gender is, I guess. Nice. I remember reading To Kill a Mockingbird for my GCSE English Lit as well. And I remember it probably was the only book I'd read cover to cover by the time I got to college. And we got asked, what's your favourite book? And it was the only one I'd ever like <laughs> remember. And I got absolutely rinsed because um, announcing that's your what? it's a good book it is a good book I don't think it's what they expected a 16 year old me in right, okay. north of Sheffield to announce <laughs> as my favourite book but you know but all that aside can I ask you mentioned Atticus Finch then yeah what did that mean to you so so Atticus is this kind of so he's a lawyer in the book he, he looks at he's a single dad he looks after two kids um and he takes on this case in the book as a lawyer that, you know, from the outset is unwinnable, right? Mm. You know, it's set in 1930s America and he represents a male who is black who has charges against him, against a, a, a woman who's white. And um, this is what kind of the book started, starts to centre around, right? And um, what I think stood out for me even though I'm, I'm not sure i quite realized this until later probably about a week ago when you asked me this question <laughs> but what when um i guess what st st stands out for me in atticus is that he stands by his values and what he knows is right even though it goes against you know he has to face a lot of hostility in the book for doing what he does and he has to come, he comes up against a lot of criticism and a lot of kind of danger for him and his family. And he, but he stands up for what he's right. And he does it in a way that's uh, compassionate, thoughtful. You know, he's just really, uh, he's got a lot of integrity, Atticus. Hmm. Um, and he, he does it without making other people feel bad, right? So it's not done in a sort of a challenge way. It's done in a, a steadfast and kind way. Yeah, yeah. And when I read the book, we're like, he's this kind of just consistent, calm, quite kind of, um, he's got just quite this, when I read the book, he's got this quite presence about him that's just quite um, containing, I think. Mm. Um, and he just always struck me as someone that, yeah, like I get, you know, stands true to his values and and isn't afraid to go against the grain to do what's right. So, yeah, there's a lot about him that I think is admirable. He's very consistent and containing in that way. Um, and of course, he loses. He loses the case. He loses the case. But it's and it is that is obviously really important. But it's it's what he stands for around all of that. Uh, sorry, I hope for anyone not who's read the book, I probably just ruined the ending. But um. <laughs> how old's to kill a mock? I don't think we need to put a spoiler warning on. I think <laughs> no, it's, fine. it's not. It's not the latest episode of Stranger Things or Game of Thrones. We're all right. 
I feel I should also put a caveat in this as well. Like, so um, Harper Lee did a second book, didn't she? <laughs> actually released where Atticus is portrayed in a very different way. Uh, so the the kid, his kid is older and sees him through adult eyes, and he's not such a he's not such a charming character right. in the second book. So for for anyone who's read both books, we're talking about Atticus version one, not yeah, version two. <laughs> Forget <laughs> version two. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm intrigued. I think I'm gonna have to take a look at that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ian, for coming on. And um, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I can't speak for everyone else out there, although I'm, no, I'm going to. I think I can. I that's been incredibly educational for me and real insight. So thank you very much. And I'm sure that people listening will will think the same and hopefully say the same. Well, thank you for having me, and I hope I hope it's been helpful. I hope it's been a little bit interesting. Uh, I hope people are still listening by the end and <laughs> I'm switched off. But thank yeah, thank you for yeah, it's been it's been great to come and talk to you about this. True pleasure. Thank you. So just to wrap up, if this has been at all helpful, please feel free if you can share it with a friend, share it online, comment, post, rate, whatever you want to do, whatever your particular platform allows you to do and whatever you feel that you want to. Anything we can do to try and spread this type of message or messages that it's you know it's okay to talk. We can you know we can do this as men as blokes. It's fine to try to connect to try and help each other. Then please do. Hopefully, be back relatively soon with a different topic, something slightly something slightly different. But in the meantime, please take care, and I'll see you soon. Draw.